It's like a black cloak. If you feel like your brain is crushed, all you want is to be on your own, isolated. Like a wheelchair in your head, Stephen. Only someone who has had it knows how paralyzing depression can be. You don't even want to go to the toilet. You don't want to make yourself food. Never mind looking in the mirror to see what your appearance is like. No one is immune. You just get to a point where you just think, you know what, I'm just, I'm too much of a burden. It's so terrifying and you are in an absolute inner turmoil of, dis of despair. There's a one in four chance that depression will affect you at some stage in your life. Don't. I can't really put myself together against myself. Oh, don't hurt me because I've got an illness called depression. Understand me a bit more. Don't be hard on me. Don't stigmatize me. It's bad enough to get it, but the stigma can make you feel much worse. This is the truth about depression. Cahill is facing a milestone. It's his 40th birthday and he's putting on a good front. This club for me is familiar to me, so it is. it is one of my safety nets. So I'm comfortable with this actual arena here that we're in tonight. But uh, it's at its limits. The sooner I get home and out of these uh, silly clothes, like the better, I get a cup of tea in front of me. And it'll probably take me a long time to wind down the night. I don't know if I'll get to sleep because I'm on a high now, but I don't know, maybe they'll all come shortly after it, I don't know. For the past 20 years, Cahill has battled with chronic depression. If and when I'm told I've got a, an incurable condition sometime later on in life, I'll accept it better. But it will be nothing compared to the death that I've lived the whole of my life. Every day I have went through death with this depression. It is extraordinary that thousands of us in Northern Ireland will suffer from depression, and yet so many people will feel the need to hide it. Why? Because of the stigma. People with depression are judged to be weak. Some people even go so far as to think it does not exist. I wanted to find out the real truth about depression. Cahill's depression hit him suddenly when he was a student coming home from Belfast. I remember shouting at the bus driver, stop, and I had to get off. What was happening to you? There was a fear, a cloud just came all over me, so it did sheer panic, rush of uh, emotions, and I didn't know, Stephen, it was... It was like a deathly feeling, so it was, and I had to get out. So I was standing on the side of the motorway and I rang for my father to come and pick me up, and that was the start of my mental health problems. Cahill didn't leave the house for a year. It's not a thing you want to turn around and say to somebody, I think you're mental. You know, which undeniably I am. Whatever way you want to butter it up, I have a mental health problem. Are you frightened of saying that out loud? No, I'm not afraid to say it now, you know. Uh, I have absolutely no fear of that stigma that's attached to it, like, you know, accepting the fact that I have a severe mental illness was the first thing in curing myself. But for those not able to see their depression as an illness, it is really important to show what is actually happening inside the head. Examining the brain through imaging is a relatively new area of science. 
It's only been studied over the past 15 years or so. I've come to the University of Manchester, one of the main centres in the UK for brain imaging. The part of the brain responsible for memory and emotion is the hippocampus. It is here that depression shows up. What's fascinating is that the hippocampus in depressed people behaves differently than the hippocampus in those without the illness. And so this is a cut through the brain and I've just outlined in black the areas which were... Professor Ian Anderson is leading the research. There's been quite a, a number of studies which have suggested that people who are depressed don't just have an alteration in how the brain's working, but also actually in the structure of the brain. So there's, and the hippocampus has been one of the areas that's been most found to be smaller in people with depression. Smaller? Smaller. So you've got the, the hippocampus, mm. which is this part of the brain which deals with emotion. Yes, and memory, yes. And, and if someone develops depression, mm. are you telling me part of the hippocampus, the grey matter, shrinks? Well, that's what we've found. So a bit like if you don't exercise, your muscles shrink. It may be the same happens with the brain. If, you're, if a bit of the brain that's important uh, isn't functioning so well, that area uh, becomes essentially smaller. Professor Anderson explained to me how his studies show this change in the brain and how treatment affects it. Our group of patients were people who had been depressed on average about five months and the sort of people who'd be getting treatment from their general practitioner. And what we found was that if we looked at the hippocampus, we found a striking decrease in the amount of grey matter, that's the part of the brain that's got nerve cells and the connections between nerve cells in, uh, in people who are depressed. And this was about a 25% decrease. So it's a quite a striking and a staggering uh, change, in fact. Well, you're dead, right? It's staggering. So people with depression in your study had 25% less grey matter than those non-depressed people. In, in, in this area of the hippocampus, that's right. I find it amazing that the brain shrinks when you're depressed and that it is actually possible to see those changes for yourself. What we found after eight weeks treatment is that we had a partial, we had a significant increase in the amount of grey matter in these, in these areas. That's what the yellow dots are showing So these there. yellow dots are the uh, increase, but it was nowhere near back to normal. This increase is only the order of a few percent. So you're still way down compared to how you would be normal. But if we then look at a group of people who have been well for years, we find that it goes completely back to normal. So somewhere between eight weeks and a few years, the brain seems to recover fully in people who recover and stay well. So... I'm sorry to make this so simplistic, but the better chance you give yourself at recovery, mm -hmm. in other words, treatment, mm -hmm. getting the right advice, whether it is talking therapies, whether it's antidepressants, over a, 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 a longer period of time, the better chance you have of growing all of that grey matter back. That's what we'd think. For those of you who are doubters, there is evidence that depression actually exists in the brain. It wasn't always the case. In the past, people with the illness sometimes disappeared for months at a time. Let me just give you a sense of the stigma that there was in terms of the infrastructure. So the main hospitals were located very close to Belfast city centre. You've got to go a lot further out for the hospitals for infectious diseases. And then outside of Belfast, in the depths of the countryside, the old lunatic asylums.
This is Holywell Hospital. It was actually built about 120 years ago for patients who were mentally ill to find sanctuary. The Belfast Asylum was at bursting point and they needed somewhere like this. Now it would be said that when people come out here, big sweeping driveways in the middle of nowhere, that once they turn that corner they wouldn't be seen for quite a while. And actually that's where the phrase comes from, going around the bend. In the past, people with depression were called lunatics. I've been looking through the records of the old Belfast mental hospital that used to be here in Knockbracken. Here's John. 11th of May 1944, the war years. And look, he came in here with a ration book and an identity card. John didn't have much else. He had one pair of socks, one shirt, and a gas mask. Here's Charles, come in in 1941. Not very many possessions marked down here at all. He had one vest, two pair of socks, one shirt. Look what it says up the side. Deceased, no friends, all property to be destroyed. This new ward in Knockbracken doesn't even look like a hospital. Things are very different these days. Heather had no history of depression. Everything was great. She was newly married and loved her job as a nurse. She was a first aider on a summer camp and then one day her life changed forever when a child suddenly became ill. The child came to me saying that he was feeling short of breath and things just deteriorated very quickly. What happened? I didn't really want to go into this too okay, much. But don't don't go any further than you want to. He he just had a severe asthma attack on the field and um, we rung for an ambulance. But by the time the ambulance got there, we had to start, before they arrived, we had to start CPR. I can see the pain in your face now. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's a really traumatic event in your life. And essentially, Heather, you... you a little boy died in your presence and it's something that the majority of us will never experience. Yeah, you know when you're you're having a camp and it's it's all supposed to be fun, you never think that that anything like this would ever happen. At the time of the child's death, Heather was pregnant. Her depression began when she became a mother herself. I was starting to panic over things. I'd never panicked before and I couldn't catch a breath. My heart was racing in my chest. I was having chest pain and just couldn't breathe. Were you sleeping much? No. No, I couldn't sleep. My head was filled with thoughts of just you know, thoughts of what happened, thoughts of things that could happen. Was something going to happen to my child and I would sit and watch her at night. Heather felt she had to cover up her illness. On the outside, when I went out through the doors, I gave people the impression that everything was okay. Because I didn't want people looking down on me or saying, oh, it's just attention-seeking behaviour. And what people were going to think about me. America always seems to be a few steps ahead of us in medical matters and I wanted to find out what they were doing so I headed off to Missouri Fast and slow. In, still ECT 
or electroconvulsive therapy has got a bad reputation, thanks in part to films like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in the 1970s. <laughs> if not a little bit heavy. Hello, Dr. Conway. Hey. I'll tell you what, you turn that on and I'll be suing you for millions, Dr. Conway. I wasn't going to have the treatment, of course, but I was curious about it and how it worked. It's hard to understand how a bolt of electricity to the brain could help depression. The whole point of ECT is to induce a seizure. What a seizure essentially is, is a massive discharge of neurons in the cortex moving in a wave. And why would you want to do that? How does that help depression? Over time, when you repetitively do this, when you repetitively induce these seizures, it's signaling to the different parts of the brain that, that are responsible for maintenance of mood to produce the normal amount of receptors on the neurons so that they go back to normal, sort of compared to defibrillating a heart. In other words, it's like a computer reboot to the brain. Usually about after five treatments or so, the person starts to feel not depressed. Why the controversy if it's all proven? I think the whole idea of introducing electricity into someone's brain is a frightening thing. And the type of ECT that's sometimes pictured in movies, like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, it, we've come such a long way since then. So it's, it's very safe now, and some people would even argue it's safer than medicine, because very, very few people have any problems with it. Dr. Chris Kelly is one of Northern Ireland's leading experts in depression. He's been working as a psychiatrist for 30 years. ECT doesn't seem to have the same scary reputation nowadays. In the city hospital in Belfast, Chris carries it out on around five patients a week. We don't use ECT a lot. It's only for the more severe or refractory forms of depression, or perhaps when an individual has had a particularly good response, we would use it. So it is a very rarely used treatment, but still the strongest treatment that we have. And it's really used more as a life-saving treatment uh, to relieve or to relieve ex extreme suffering when no other treatment has really worked. Anne has had ECT in the past. When you come out, Stephen, you feel in a daze, and you feel your, your head's not thinking. And then through time, you feel that this depression's lifting, and you feel elated. You feel, God, I'm not in this black hole. I feel like I'm alive again. But it only lasts for a certain time, Stephen, because depression is so severe and illness, it doesn't cure it. Anne has had a serious mental illness for the past 40 years. On top of that, she has depression. How does the depression make you feel? It feels that you're just totally alone. You're totally alone within your, your head. And then maybe you get up when you dress and you wash and you look the part and all, say, God, you look well today. But inside your head, you're so depressed. You feel tired, you feel lethargic. You feel you put the kettle on to make a cup of tea and you haven't got the energy to even make a cup of tea. You feel so depressed, you just... Life is just going on around you and you don't know what's happening to you. My sister suffers from MS and I'll say, but her head's all right. She's a physical disability, she, everybody can see that and help her. But to think, oh, Monty, aunt's all right, our aunt's all right, but our aunt's not all right. Our aunt has this black hole in her head, like a wheelchair in your head, Stephen. Anne knows only too well the stigma that comes with depression. People that will say to you, the silliest thing in the world, what are you to be depressed about? You have everything, you've got a good home, you can go here, you can take a beer, you can go and visit your friends, you, you're the life and soul of the party, you were always good crack when you were young. What happened to you? 
what it's a state of mind which you can't explain people have said pull yourself together and get yourself on that's the worst thing to stay in Stephen why? because if you could you would you're so depressed you can't do that <laughs> You have already seen how Cahill struggles with depression. What you don't know is that he is a wealthy businessman running this engineering plant outside Cool Island. You're financially secure. I'm financially secure at the minute, yeah. And could probably take retirement. He's so successful, he's been shortlisted at the Mid Ulster Business Awards, but his struggle against his illness is a lifelong battle. Cahill thought he had his depression under control, but then, a few years ago, he had another breakdown, just as he was trying to expand his business. Resources were all looked at carefully, and location, and market, and uh, the only thing that wasn't factored in was my mental health resource. That stress was making his depression worse. He went from never touching alcohol to drinking heavily. The culmination of going on and off medication, stronger, less, sleeping tablets, uppers, downers, uh, alcohol, coming in the evenings, more alcohol, to get to sleep, more alcohol, and then it got to stage getting up more alcohol. Again, it's hard for me to imagine because I see you as this healthy, robust, strong businessman. We're in a two-storied house, Stephen, as you know, and I jumped out of the top story window. So how does depression get you to jump out a window? The thoughts in your head are that nonsensical, that I don't even know what I was trying to get away from something. I don't know, I was trying to get away from Caja. So it was... Like many people with serious depression, Heather reached a stage where she didn't think she could take any more. It was her thoughts of her family that kept her going. You just get to a point where you just think, you know what, I'm just, I'm too much of a burden. And I think you get to the point where you nearly do think that it'd be easier for them. And you know, looking back now, I know that it definitely would not have been easier. Um, and it was definitely the wrong thing for me to think. Stephen, I'm 61 and I've had this ongoing on my life from when I was 19. I've attempted suicide, I've been so low. I just can't see a way out. But with the backup that I've got, there's, there's, there's people out there to help. Why um why does it get so low that you that you decide to try to take your life? Why? You just feel you're in the way, Stephen. You just feel you everybody's gonna be better off without you. The pressure is so severe. And you attempted it recently? I attempted it about six to eight weeks ago. And what happened recently? The police got me, Stephen. And got me to the hospital. Because I mentioned to a, a, a stranger, I felt so depressed. And then must have picked up the sign and rang to get me to the, get to the house. And did they have to bring they, the door down? Or they came and they got the key off my neighbour. My neighbour keeps the spare key and they got me in the fireman bed with the tablets in me. And got to hospital and got sorted out, thank God. In the United States, it's estimated that 10% of people with treatment resistant depression take their own lives. Vegas Nerve Stimulation Therapy, VNS therapy, has a unique mechanism of action. But now, there's an experimental treatment available even for the very severe cases. The vagal nerve stimulator is like a pacemaker planted under the skin 
that sends a signal to the brain. Susan is a teacher who decided to get one fitted after suffering severe depression for most of her life. The pulse comes from the battery pack. It travels along the wiring to the vagus nerve and that impulse travels into the brain. It's no big deal. I can show you the scar. So that's literally where the little battery pack is? That's right. It's right in there. Okay. And then they had to make an incision in your neck, did they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was... I looked like the Bride of Frankenstein for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> they typically make the incision in the neck in the fold in a natural crease so that as it heals, it's less noticeable. Yeah, I don't know that you can even notice it now. I can't notice it actually, yeah. no? Raise people, people's awareness. My psychiatrist told me about this experimental study down at St. Louis University, and I'm so grateful. It has helped me enormously. I'm still on a lot of medications, but this has kind of put a floor under me below which I can't go. And if it weren't for VNS and modern uh, psychopharmaceuticals, I would just be curled up in a corner somewhere. You know, I would just be unable to function. So it's going to run through and it's going to send a signal to test that the communication within that whole system is operating correctly. Oops, it's working. Sometimes <laughs> what happens, Susan? Just uh, feels like a pain in the neck. <laughs> it's a stimulation. You sometimes get an area where it makes you cough or... <coughs> right? Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me what you feel, Susan? Yeah, it's just a sharp pain, but it's very brief. And when that happens, I know that it's working. So I don't mind. That's for really severe cases. Most people will never be that bad. I wanted to find out about other treatments available. The starting point for most doctors are those modern psychopharmaceuticals Susan talked about. The main ones, antidepressants, which balance the chemicals in the brain. They're of moderate effectiveness. I would say that if you treat somebody with a good course, you'll probably get six to seven people out of ten better with an antidepressant trial in the first trial. Antidepressants are now one of the most prescribed drugs in the world. And we take a lot here in Northern Ireland. In 2011, over two million prescriptions were written here. Do you never think depression for you will go away? Never. I know for a fact that the tablets that my doctor has prescribed, I have to take them equally as much as a person with asthma has to take an inhaler. I have to take my tablets for the rest of my life because if I didn't, well then my life would be shortened. Doctors rate depression on a scale from mild, moderate, to severe. When you're on medication, they want you to stick to it. It is important to adjust your lifestyle, adjust your view to cope with that depression. Now, what do I mean by that? What I basically mean is if you were diabetic, you would be careful about what you eat. You would be careful that you took your medication and your insulin and you'd moderate your lifestyle. For severe forms of depression, I do think there's an importance about compliance with the treatment, whatever that treatment is, that keeps you well, and an awareness that that may need to go on for a longer period of time than perhaps other illnesses, other treatments. Denise Welch, star of Coronation Street and Loose Women, has decided she is not going to hide the illness she has suffered from for most of her life. Hello! Hello, Denise! Where are you? I hope you like that. Nice to see you. I'm terrified. <laughs> soft as anything. Hiya, Stephen. Right. Come on in. Thank you very much. Come on, I'll get the catalog. Thank you very much. Can you describe what depression does to you? How, what words would you put to it? It's so terribly frightening. 
I can't eat anything when I have it. I have absolutely no appetite. It's like putting sandpaper in my mouth. I lost two stone in three weeks when I once when I had to pull out of a pantomime and I collapsed in my dressing room with it. It had a physical manifestation uh, um, at some points, which was my face would twist and my hands would, um, it was almost like I had Bell's palsy or some kind of arthritic condition. The depression was so bad. If someone came to the door and said, you've won 23 million on the national lottery, or they said, your family have been wiped out in an aircraft disaster, I'd be like that. Nothing. You are void of feeling and emotion. And that is the most horrible thing for someone who loves their family as much as I do. And if you lose that and think you won't get better, you'll probably end up killing yourself. And I used to use thought of suicide as a comfort blanket. What do you mean? If I don't get better, I can always kill myself. And everyone will be better off without me because I'm not ever going to be able to live like this. I can't live like this. 23 years ago, when her son Matthew was born, depression struck out of the blue. I remember looking at the sterilising bottles and my mum, she'd say, go and get the bottles ready. It's four hours, he's ready for his feed. And it was like someone had said to me, there's Everest, go and climb it now. That's how it felt, to get off the settee and go and do the bottles. It was getting harder and harder for Denise to cover up her illness. She was a big star. I don't like Dougie asking you to do things that he's too scared to do himself. But was hiding a big so secret. People out on the street then. She was leading a dangerous double life when she was filming Coronation Street. Dougie could have gone and got it. People just didn't have a clue what was really going on behind the scenes. The police don't look too kindly on people who demand money with menaces. I was self-medicating. I was using drugs. I got myself into some terrible situations. I was working on drugs. I was a mess, physically, emotional wreck. I was driving to get drugs at three o'clock in the morning. And you crashed big time, didn't you? Mm. Because you had the profile, the drink, the drugs. It was a, was it self-destruct because of depression? Well, all I, all I thought about was, I need respite from this feeling. If alcohol numbs it for a bit, if cocaine numbs it for a bit, that's what I'm doing. So, which mystery star will be the first to stare into fame's unforgiving abyss? Denise was just about holding it together, but the depression was taking over. I remember when I was doing celebrity stars in their eyes and there was a wardrobe in my dressing room at Granada Television and I was in the wardrobe with the door closed thinking that they might think that I'd g gone away or left the... I was lucid and, and I can remember doing it but I was so terrified of how I felt. You know, metaphorically, there's so much in that because you're going to walk out a few minutes later. Being Petula Clark. But what you're hiding is what you're really like. You're carring in a wardrobe. And of course it's because hard. Because of an illness. Yeah. When you're alone, then life is making you lonely. You can always go. Denise talks openly because she's sick and tired of those people who say depression isn't a serious illness. I went to see a GP in London and I'd never seen this GP before. So I'm so depressed. My mum takes me down there to get some help. And she said to me, oh, well, you see, dear, I had five children. Now I just didn't have time to get depressed. That's what she said to me. That's a common reaction to depression. Some commentators have described it as a designer illness. How does it make you feel when you hear them say It that? makes me feel very angry. They've never had it. I'm all right, Jack. But oh, pull your socks up and get on with it. Because they, those are the two standard phrases. I'll snap out of it, pull yourself together. When people do say that to you, it puts an awful pressure on you. Because you can't, do, you can't actually do it. 
and when you can't it's like a failure as well so I think it makes you worse well it made me worse For Anne, coping with that stigma is one of the worst aspects of her mental illness. So how do you feel when someone says to you, you pull yourself together? You feel like saying, oh, you took my head and you've been depressed. Because people are totally ignorant, Stephen. Ignorant on, of the, on both senses of the word. They're, they're ignorant of ill manners and they're, they're ignorant of the knowledge of depression. Nobody wants to feel depressed. Do you think I want to feel if I could pull myself together? Of course I would. But it's, it's so deep in your head, Stephen, you can't. And I can't pull myself together like a pair of curtains. A depression is that severe. Don't, don't shout at me, don't. Tell me to pull myself together and get myself on. Don't hurt me anymore. Don't hurt me because I've got an illness called depression. Understand me a bit more. Don't be hard on me. Don't stigmatise me. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It is an illness. Depression is an illness. Those tears aren't running down your cheek because of your depression. No. They're running down your cheek because you feel that people don't understand. Yeah. Exactly, Stephen. They're judging you. They're judging me. They're putting a label on me, Stephen. That is an attitude that psychiatrists are all too familiar with. I've worked as a psychiatrist for 30 years and I've sadly have looked after people where depression has been the fundamental cause of them taking their own life. I've also seen people who have come into hospital severely malnourished, who have been lying in their bed neglecting themselves. It exists. I've seen it for 30 years. Trust me, it exists. It's severe. It's life-threatening. When Heather got the help she needed, she was found to have had post-traumatic stress disorder because of the trauma of a child dying in front of her. She had to wait for sessions of cognitive behavioural therapy, so-called talking therapy. Luckily for her, her church paid for her to go to England for intensive treatment. And it worked. They reprogram your thinking and try to get you to look at things differently. So are you able to talk, are you able to just to tell me in layman's terms what they actually do? They sit down and they talk to you about, right, think positive or what? Um, one of the issues I had was I found it difficult to go into crowded areas um, because I was so afraid of somebody taking on well. Um, and what they made me do was, you know, put me into those situations and I had to keep going back until the fears and anxieties lessen. And some of them were just very simple things like I had to go for a walk, had to sit down and I had to do stuff that I enjoy. To, as he said, it's like resetting the balance in your brain. It's about a person being challenged by the therapist with regard to the negative views, their negativity, their assumptions in this and doing homework on the basis of that as well to try and restructure their view about things and look at a different way of perceiving themselves and perceiving what's happening outside. Science has been investigating just that type of negative thinking. I went to the Oxford Centre for Brain Research, where they have been examining activity in the brains of depressed people. Their work centres on the amygdala, a tiny area that's like the computer hub of the brain. Just like we saw with the hippocampus, the amygdala behaves differently in depressed people. 
this area here is the amygdala that we're interested in looking at. Just right in the centre there. Yeah. Research scientist Catherine Harmer took a sample of depressed people and showed them negative images as she was scanning their brain. Her results are fascinating. They show that depressed people's brains exaggerate negative images. So these are all slices in um, the brain taken at different angles showing the response or the difference in response in the amygdala in people who are depressed and, and people who aren't depressed. And so what the, the um, activity level that you can see in um, red here is the, the difference between those two groups, the statistical difference. Yeah. In other words, the science clearly shows that people with depression lose perspective and part of their brain is much more sensitive to negativity. So in, a, in someone who has never uh, suffered from depression, we wouldn't see that orange blob at all? That's right. So when people are depressed, they showed an exaggerated, a much bigger response of the amygdala to these kinds of negative cues from, from these facial expressions. So what a, a, an amygdala with someone who's depressed does is it makes a mountain out of a molehill. It looks at a, a, a sad face or a sad incident and it exaggerates it. That's right, it's more tuned in to picking up even mildly negative or ambiguous cues and, and reacting as if it was a much more negative, a much more important stimulus. But there is hope. They also find the amygdala does respond positively to treatment, like antidepressants or talking therapies. Do you know what's crazy about this, Chris? Here we are, you and other experts, clearly showing me how science can actually detect literal changes in the brain. And yet we still have very educated people questioning whether depression actually exists. Yeah. And if you actually do a, a CT or computerized tomographic image of the size of people's adrenal glands, this is not in the brain now, this is in the body, the stress hormone they are significantly larger in people with depression. So you have a, uh, you have a toxic environment of a, in severe depression of people pumping out stress chemicals that are much higher. Those chemicals are also in the brain as well. This is a place where history and memory meet. I'm in the Ulster Museum in Belfast at the Troubles Exhibition. It's a quiet, serene sort of place. You can feel the sadness of the 3,700 deaths we had here. It's all recent history for many of us. Researchers have found that 40% of people here have suffered some sort of traumatic event. According to a study carried out at the University of Ulster, Northern Ireland has the highest recorded rate of post-traumatic stress disorder in the world. And here's something that might surprise you. It is still going on years after the troubles have ended. Here at the Everton Centre in North Belfast, they know all about it. This unique centre is on the interface between Protestant and Catholic areas. What we find is that when you're traumatised, you live in the past. You live with the past events. It's nearly like you're stuck in the past. 
you live in terror of the future because you're always waiting for the next bad thing to happen to you and you miss the present. And what we hope to offer here is an opportunity to, to give people a chance to live back in the present in their daily lives. This is the only place of its type for people with troubles related to depression and provides a safe place for them to tell their story and get help. We would have many, many of our clients with past addiction issues, for example, alcohol and trauma, drugs and trauma, any kind of addiction and trauma is very related because how else do you cope? You know, how else do you get by? How else do you survive? I was really surprised that most of the people using this centre are men between the age of 25 and 40. Many of them are under threat from their own side. Many of our young people would see the people who either shot them, took them away, tortured them on a regular basis. And so can you imagine how that heightens their fear and their terror? And many suffer from anxiety and depression. And particularly, I think many of them suffer from a lot of isolation and do present with the symptoms of the complex post-traumatic stress. The ripple effect of the troubles on families has never been measured. But if your parents were directly affected, the chances are your life will be too. Back in North Belfast, I'm in St. Patrick's College, a stone's throw from the Everton Centre. Depression. I'm talking about depression. The charity Aware Defeat Depression is trying to teach young people what to look out for in this talk for 12 and 13 year olds. I'm going to give you situations in a day. And if I put you in better form, say higher. If I put you in worse form, say lower. You wake up in the morning, boys, and it's Monday morning. <laughs> Straight away, you are up below par, eh? You get to school, you've spent all weekend doing a bit of homework, and you forgot it. Then your friend bounces over and tells you, that teacher's off the day, we're going to have a free period for two periods and do nothing. Har. <laughs> you go in the canteen at lunchtime, your friends are all over there and they're completely ignoring you, you don't know why. Then one of them comes over and says, God, I didn't see you, but I tell you a crack and he's playing football and you have a bit of laugh. You're on your way home from school, you find 20 quid lying in the street. Har. <laughs> Somebody accuses you of stealing the money and takes it off you. Then your friend phones or texts to tell you that the wee girl that you've liked for a long time likes you too. Tell a trick. Tell a trip. Somebody fancy me. <laughs> See where your mood, boys. That's healthy. It goes up and it goes down. Now, if you were suffering with depression, it would look more like this. Thinking your friends aren't speaking to you, does that to your mood. Realising they are, does that to your mood. Fighting 20 quid lying in the street, does that to your mood. Been accused of stealing it, does that to your mood. Been told that the wee girl fancies you, you probably just wouldn't believe it. And it would do that to your mood. You see what I mean? Depression is a wild, sad mood that doesn't change. The things that normally would have lifted you and given you a wee lift and down again aren't lifting you anymore. That's depression. Does that make sense? Michaela knows too well the pain of depression. I lost my sister to suicide when I was 16. She was 18. And as I always say in the presentations, I genuinely believe that if somebody had to come into our school and told us what I now tell the young people, she may not have become so unwell that suicide was an option. I believe very strongly that it is the stigma that you know, stops people from getting help. Ideally, a healthy mood, you will be happy and you will be sad, but it won't go to the extremes. The talk was changing the boys' thinking. Do you think you would judge someone because not, they've got I, depression? No, no, like, I wouldn't judge them. But if, why? Because I really fully understand why and that it's not fun to make fun of people with depression because it could happen to me or anybody else so I wouldn't do it now 
like there's people like you can just ring up and talk to them about it and just let it out and you don't have to like rack stuff and stuff like that just to get it out just talk to someone when more and more people say the same thing about something there's a power behind it there's a momentum behind it oh yeah like depression will probably go down in numbers instead of yeah Depression is a disease, like cancer, and you shouldn't slag anybody about it. So why do so many people do it? Because they think they're different, but they're not. They're just like everybody else. You would think we, here in Northern Ireland, would be a special case when you hear about the ripple effect of the Troubles. But it doesn't sound like it. In 2011... Professor John Appleby, a top economist, reported that Stormont spends up to 30% less on mental health than England, despite having over 30% more cases. We are running considerably off the pace compared to our, our cousins across the way. So is this government, this local administration, taking mental health seriously? Well, that's a good question. What do you think? I think we could do more. What type of things do people get in England that they don't get here in Northern Ireland in terms of depression? Probably better access to psychological services, specialised doctors with uh, experience in that area in England as well. So you can get talking therapy far easier on the NHS in England than you can in Northern Ireland? That would be my understanding. You can get counsellors, counselling easier than you can get here in Northern Ireland? and yet we pay the same level of tax. We're not at a discount here in Northern Ireland. Tax rate isn't cut from 40% to 30% for us here in Northern Ireland, and yet we're getting a, a worse deal. It'd be better if we had a better deal. So, how much are things really improving in mental health? It seems to me like we have a way to go. If you go back to the 60s, and I think cancer has now made that jump from a stigmatised disorder to one that's not. So, you know, we live in hope, and I hope that that will, that will uh, change. But we, we do need to have champions, we do need to have politicians willing to move further in order to improve the treatments and improve the access to treatments for the population of Northern Ireland. Do you know what strikes me, Chris? We're, we're educated... In, in, in modern living now, how to look after our bodies. I know I'm no shining example of having listened. Do you not think we should be educated in how to look after our brain? You know, we're told go to the gym three or four times a week, eat vegetables, eat fruit. So what do you do to protect your brain? What do you do to protect yourself against depression? Sleeping well, trying to keep a sensible sleep pattern, eating regularly, trying to keep a sensible balanced diet, and having time some time away to have your own to relax as well as avoiding too much alcohol uh, and other uh, substances these are good things in terms of trying to avoid depression and mental difficulties generally. Cahill still manages to be at the top of his game but at the business awards he can only get through the night with careful planning. It's quite an ordeal. I've already planned my day out, as in number one and beside an exit. In case you think that happened by uh, chance, no, it wasn't. I asked for our table to be put beside an exit. So it, uh, it's a safety net that I've uh, learned to put up throughout my life. And I've also had a few tablets in me before I came here tonight, so... Sport is a big part of Cahill's life. He's decided to take things into his own hands. Here at Derry Trest GAA ground on the shores of Loch Ney, he's using his business skills to plan a one and a half million pound centre to ensure faster treatment for depressed people in his area. What's your dream here? On this car park here that we're standing on, hopefully within a year, will be the start of the first ever Centre of Excellence for Emotional Health and Wellbeing in Northern Ireland. And so because you've suffered from it, you've realised there's not enough help, so you're going to build a whole facility, or at least make it happen. Yeah. 
if they build it, they will come, Stephen. The, uh, the need for it is uh, it's overwhelming. If you're coming here straight away, you're getting immediate expert help. Cahill has successfully negotiated a grant of £860,000 to make that dream a reality. Anne keeps herself well with her medication and help from Mindwise, a charity for people with mental health problems. As I, keep on. I go to Mindwise in Rurgan. We do boxercise, we do cooking. Boxercise? Yeah. You box? I could knock you out, Stephen. I'm thinking one of my nightmares would be if I was sent down to the BBC for you lot to practice in me. I well, I, me you, I'd be a woman. And you could sort me out too, boy. And does the boxer size help you in terms of your yeah, depression? Yeah, it relieves all the, pr the the stress in your head, Stephen. Yes, and they, they do have a lot of things, you know, that it's around depression to get you lifted, your mood lifted. Psychiatrists say that most depression can be cured within three to six months. Heather is proof that depression doesn't have to be a life sentence and it's possible to be cured. She's made great strides in her recovery. I feel that I'm getting my life back more than I have ever felt. You know, and every day I have, I still have to make an effort. I still have to say, right, this depression could be here, but I just have to stop it. You know, I have to push it away. And you're back to having a life again? I am back to having a life. My, my husband's getting his dinner cooked for me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should like, be proud of yourself. <laughs> oh, I am. I am proud of myself. And I think one of the, the important things, and one of the things that the doctor over in England, the specialist, he said to me, one day you can use your experience to help somebody else. And he says, you can't just put it in a box and put it away and forget that 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 difficult period in your life, you have to one day use that experience and help somebody else. After around 20 years of suffering, Denise had a breakthrough when she heard about a doctor who specialised in hormone treatment. It was a gel treatment and I started to get better. I always believed the origin was hormonal. You're not depressed, you have a baby, and you become seriously depressed. Postnatal depression. You've, you've given birth to another human being in your body. Chemical chaos is so great, and greater in some people, it doesn't balance itself out. Denise knows how tough depression is. But she also knows you don't have to let it beat you. There's, a, there's a, a philosophy that some people have that it's a form of weakness. You're weak if you get it. If you get through it, you're fucking strong, let me tell you. You are strong to get through it. For details of organisations offering help and support, call the BBC Action Line to hear recorded information on 08000 566 787. Lines are open 24 hours a day and are free from a landline, but mobile operators will charge.